Chapter 23, Trick Plays. We all set then? Alex asked the Cyclones. We've only got two innings to pull this off. His teammates grinned at him and nodded. At the plate, Pinkerton grounded sharply to second, but Baba Yaga glided over on her mortar, scooped up the ball, and threw it to first in plenty of time for the, the out. Okay, that witch is number one on the hit list, Alex told them. Toad strode to the plate in a disguise as a washerwoman. Oh, dear me, he said in a high-pitched voice. How can I ever hope to replace that brave, wonderful, magnificent toad? Just shut up and hit, Mrs. Tig Tiggy Winkle, Dorothy called from the dugout. Dorothy dinked the wicked stepsister's third pitch over the genie at short and jogged down to first base. Go up for those, ye fool, Long, yelled, Long John Silvers yelled from first. As you command, O oh my master, the shortstop said, bowing. Dorothy batted next and worked a walk. When she was on first and Toad was on second, they nodded to each other and turned to the to the Baba Yaga, who floated between first and second. I say, Baba Yaga, Toad said in his washerwoman voice, would you like me to wash those old rags you're wearing? The hag howled, losing a year off of her life with Toad's question. Baba Yaga, what's seven times seven, Dorothy asked. The witch screamed, losing another year. Baba Yaga, Toad asked, does this apron make me look fat? Baba Yaga, why isn't there mo more... Why isn't there mouse-flavored cat food? Do cats eat bats, Baba Yaga, or do bats eat cats? Ah! The decrepit old woman cried, and she flashed her claw-like fingers at both of them. With a pop and a pop, Do Toad and Dorothy turned into chickens. Alex charged onto the field, followed by the rest of the cyclones. The reapers came rushing from their dugout, too. Before they could meet, the fairy godmother, umpiring at first, waved her wand with a shower of glitter, and both teams froze mid-charge. Oh dear, oh dear, this will never do, she tutted. Unlawful use of magic, Charles Wallace agreed. Baba Yaga, thou art banished from this tournament, Merlin cried. He swirled his wand, muttered an incantation, and the Baba Yaga disappeared with a vroom. The fairy godmother waved her wand, and the cyclones and the reapers became unstuck. Where did my second baseman go, the wolf roared. Forget her. What about Dorothy and Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, Alex, Alex asked. Not to worry, Charles Wallace told them. Your two mates are still in there somewhere. He closed his eyes, searching with his mind. Let's see. Yes, there's Dorothy, he said. And before their eyes, one of the chickens transformed back into the cyclone's leader. And inside this one, oh, I think perhaps there is someone else in there. But Mrs. Tiggywinkle is as good a name as any, he said. And the second chicken transformed into Toad, who quickly pulled his washerwoman dress up around him. As for the Baba Yaga, rules are rules, the fairy godmother told the wolf. The reapers will have to play shorthanded. Play on. The wolf growled, but there was nothing more he could do. Alex gave the base runners a thumbs up. One reaper down, eight to go. In the bottom half of the evening, with the score seven to four, Br'er Rabbit slipped away from third to sneak up to the dragon, who lay curled with one eye closed and the other watching Long John's brass lamp. Don't even think about trying to steal my lamp, the dragon purred. Steal your lamp? I wouldn't think of it. I was thinking it would was awful plain looking, though. A lot plainer than this one. Br'er Rabbit pulled a solid gold lamp polished to a shrine from his pocket. Nanny May had produced it from her magic trench coat just for the occasion. The dragon's eyes got wide and he stirred. I don't suppose you would like to trade, would you? He asked. Trade? Why, this golden lamp is priceless. Only thing I wish it did was work as a lamp. This one here is solid gold through and through. This one works as a lamp, the dragon said. Good one, too. Well, that's something, Br'er Rabbit told him. You got a deal. The dragon collected the old brass lamp with his tail and quickly swapped it, for the, uh, swapped it out for the one Br'er Rabbit had. When the trade was made, the dragon snorted, little puffs of flames and smoke coming out of his nose and he, as he laughed. Fool, that old lamp is worthless. Says you, Br'er Rabbit said, and he began to rub it. Long John Silver, who had bunted out to first, saw Br'er Rabbit with the lamp and charged across the diamond. Arr, ye great stupid beast, get that treasure back. I like this one better, the dragon said. It's prettier. Long John drew his flintlock pistol on Br'er Rabbit. A blue mist was already escaping from the spot of the lamp and forming into the shape of a man. Say what thou wilt of me, the genie said. Here am I, the slave of whoso hath in his hand the lamp. 
I ain't much on having slaves, Br'er Rabbit told him. I give you your freedom, Genie, to do as you see fit. The genie's eyes flared red, and it turned on Long John Silver. Oh, bloody yell, the pirate said, backing away. Genie, shine my boot. Genie, get me a soda. Genie, wash my eye patch, the genie said. I have been your slave for many moons, Silver. Now you will be mine. Long John Silver fired his pistol into the blue cloud that enveloped him, but it didn't help. A few salty curses later, he was gone, trapped inside the lamp. The genie turned on Br'er Rabbit, and he flinched. But the genie's eyes were softer now, and he bowed low. A thousand blessings upon you, most compassionate and wise little rabbit. I thank you and take my leave. The blue mist swirled, picked up its lamp, and was gone. This isn't fair, the wolf cried. I just lost my shortstop and my first baseman. Play on, play on, the fairy godmother called with a smile. The Cyclones came to bat in the ninth inning with the, the score 8-4, to four, but with more than half of the Reapers' infield gone, they were quickly able to load the bases. But it was up to Jack Pumpkinhead to drive them in. Oh, Alex, Jack moaned, your plan is working. I'm only still awful at baseball. I'm the weak link, the rotten apple, the wrench in the works, the... All right, all right, don't beat yourself up, Jack. I wish I had a head for baseball like you. For a minute there, when Dorothy was carving me a new head her knife made me sharp but now i got a head full of nothing again hang on jack i got i've got an idea alex picked up a baseball but it started to slip through his fingers he was fading again he instinctively tried to catch the falling ball and he did his hands rematerializing the fading was getting worse though he didn't know how much time he had left focusing all his thoughts and energy on staying solid alex lifted the lid on jack's head and dropped the ball inside Jack sat up straight. Earned run average is calculated by dividing the number of earned runs allowed by the number of innings pitched and multiplying by nine, Jack recited. Alex, you've done it. I know everything there is to know about baseball. Jack wobbled his head and the baseball thunk thunked against the sides. All right, Professor, go get him. Easy out, easy out, the raccoon-like Tanuki called from the outfield. Everyone in the stadium must have thought the same thing, including the wicked stepsister who threw a lollipop of a pitch right over the plate. Jack hitched his bat, planted his foot, and turned on the ball like an all-star, belting it deep left into deep it to deep left field. Back, back, back it went, and before the sleepy dragon playing all of left and center could even think to take flight, the ball was gone for a grand slam. Yeah, 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 Jack, Alex screamed. Emerald fireworks boomed in the sky overhead. The cyclones steamed, streamed out onto the field to welcome Jack at home plate and lift him on their shoulders to parade him back to the dugout. The score was tied. It was a whole new ball game with less than an inning left to play. Two batters later, Dorothy hobbled to the plate in obvious pain. Are you all right, Charles Wallace asked. It's these glass cleats, Dorothy told him. She was wearing a spectacularly uncomfortable pair pulled, again, from Nanny May's bottomless pockets. Whoever can wear them hits and pitches like a Hall of Famer, but they don't they, they don't seem to fit. Of course they don't fit you, cried the wicked stepsister. She called a timeout and hurried from the pitcher's mound. Here, let me try them on. Leave it alone, the wolf cried from first where he'd moved when Long John Silver had been swept away by the genie. They're tricking you. The wicked stepsister ignored him and wedged her feet into the tiny glass cleats. They clearly didn't fit, but she wouldn't admit it. You see, how could a... How could a loser like you ever wear the shoes of a hall of famer? If I'd had these months ago, I could have, ow, I could have played for the Royals. You're right, Dorothy told her. They fit like they were made for you. I guess you're the one who gets to hit happily ever after. The wicked stepsister put her nose in the air and limped back to the mound. She fell twice along the way. Take those off, Rumpelstiltskin called from third. You'll never be able to pitch in them. The wicked stepsister went into her windup and grunted as she threw. Her first pitch went over the reach of the towering king of Anwen as catcher. And after, 40, after four shake, shaky pitches, Dorothy had an easy walk. Think she'll ever figure out those shoes make her worse? Alex asked the other cyclones as he grabbed his bat. Not the way she's written, old man, Toad said. The Reapers were beginning to look like a backyard baseball team. The wolf sent the wicked stepsister to first and took over for her on the mound. But the only other infielder was Rumpelstiltskin, who had moved from third to somewhere near short. In the outfield, only Tanuki and the dragon remained. The wolf was a tricky southpaw, but the Cyclones were still able to score once more with the Reapers, so spread out behind him, 
putting them in the lead by a single run with only three outs separating them from being crowned tournament champs. We're winning, Dorothy told Alex as they changed sides. We're actually winning. Was there ever a doubt, he joked, and Dorothy laughed. The first reaper to bat was Rumpelstiltskin, who had a knack for turning bad pitches into gold. He drove a two and one pitch into short right field and stopped at first, and the reapers had something going on with the wicked stepsister up next. Dorothy got the ball back and worked it over in her hands, pacing around the mound. Sure, letting a runner on base with no outs wasn't the best way to start the bottom of the ninth in a one-run game, Alex thought, but if she lost her cool now, it was all over for sure. He called time out and jogged to the mound with Toad to check on her. Dorothy, what's... He was going to ask her what's wrong, but then she looked up and looked up. She was grinning. Hey, ya golden boy, she said, putting her arm around him and giving him an enthusiastic hug. Alex and Toad looked at each other stunned. Dorothy was smiling, giving out hugs. While Dorothy still had her arm around him, Alex felt something hard press into his armpit from behind. The ball. Dorothy was passing him the ball for a hidden ball trick. How you been, golden boy, she said, shaking him with another hug as she worked the ball further up his sleeve. You good? Yeah, Alex told her with a smile. I'm good. You've both gone mad, Toad said, not understanding at all. Have you been bewitched, old girl? Is this some kind of spell? No, it's all good, Tiggy Winkle. Time in. Toad shook his head and went back to shortstop, and Alex jogged back to his position. Rumpelstiltskin took a lead off first, and when he was a few steps away, Alex dropped the ball from his armpit into his glove and tagged the dwarf on the shoulder. Out, cried the fairy godmother, and the crowd laughed and applauded as the Jumbotron replayed what had happened. What? Rumpelstiltskin cried. No, not fair. Not fair, not fair, not fair. On the last not fair, he stomped so hard he bruised his right leg up, to, or buried his right leg up to his knee. The ground shifted and rumbled, and the laughter in the stands became a gasp as the stadium shook. A crack opened in the ground near first base, and Rumpelstiltskin tumbled into its black depths, crying, Not fair, as he disappeared. Dorothy and Jack joined Alex at the edge of the hole and peered down into the nothingness. Wow, um, you guys didn't tell me that part of the story, Alex said. It's an old variant, Dorothy said. I'd forgotten it. Hmm, the fairy godmother said, flinting, flitting about over the chasm. Can't have unsafe playing conditions, now can we? She waved her hand over the crack in the infield and sewed the two sides back together like stitching closed a seam. Play on, she said happily. Nice one, Kansas, Alex told Dorothy. He went to pull the ball in her glove, but it dropped through his hands and thunked to the ground. He was fading away again. No, not yet, he said, not yet. Alex grabbed for Dorothy's hand, but he felt nothing, not even a tingle. The world grew fuzzy and black. Dorothy was yelling something, panic written all over her face, but he couldn't hear her. He couldn't hear anything. It was quiet again, so silent he couldn't even hear his own breath. And the last thing he saw before the world went away was Jack and Toad and the rest of the Cyclones running toward him, reaching out for something that wasn't there.